Good evening, TSU community, and welcome to our first COVID conversation this evening. My name is Dr. Rashid Masavin. I am the Dean of College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences here at Texas Southern University. We have assembled an amazing panel of experts this evening to answer all your questions and concerns. It's a great honor for me to take a couple of minutes here and introduce them to you. Dr. Hotez, who will, join, who will be joining us shortly, is the Dean, National School of Tropical Medicine, Professor of Pediatrics and Molecular Virology and Microbiology at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Woodard, she is the Professor and Director, Humana Integrated Health System Sciences Institute here at University of Houston College of Medicine. We have with us Dr. Keichel, she is Associate Director of, for Research, Autism Center, Texas Children's Hospital, Co-Director, Neurobehavioral Core, and Associate Professor, Depart Department of Pediatrics, Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Hunter is with us this evening. Dr. Hunter is a Clinical Associate Professor here at Texas Southern University College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. He's also a Clinical Pharmacy Specialist in Breast Medical Oncology, at UT Health Memorial Hermann Cancer Center. Last but certainly not least is my co-host, co-moderator, Missouri Dale, our epidemiologist who has been with us for about six months. Missouri Dale has been named TSU's COVID response czar. She coordinates all aspects of testing and response to COVID-19 here at TSU. With that, welcome everybody, welcome all of our attendees. Missouri Dale, back to you. So, um, as the Dean said, my name is Zuri and I have the great pleasure of moderating this conversation. So, as of yesterday, our 14 day county average of new cases is 18.9%. Our county vaccination numbers of around 50%. Vaccination hesitancy is a critical issue as we face the Delta variant. We are seeing the number of new cases and worse, hospitalizations even greater than a year ago before vaccinations were available. The vast majority of infections are among unvaccinated people, leading some to call this wave a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And while it is easy to dismiss or demonize those who have chosen not to vaccinate, it's really not that simple. Americans cite a range of reasons for not getting the vaccine. And understanding the barriers and what might persuade individuals may be crucial to fighting the Delta variant. We would like to have an honest and civil conversation about what can truly be a life or death situation. According to recent data from the Kaiser Family Foundation, nearly a quarter of Black Americans are taking a wait and see approach to the COVID-19 vaccine. And at a time when individuals and families have been presented with the critical decision of whether to get vaccinated against COVID-19, we cannot ignore an important piece of history that we must address first if we are going to have these conversations. So before we begin tonight, I am honored to use our platform to share a few powerful and moving stories from descendants of those who were involved in the Tuskegee experiment to help shed some light on these inspiring men, their legacy, and their dedication to improving public health for generations to come. At this time, I'm going to share my screen. Immediately following this short excerpt, we're going to jump right into our questions. I said, did someone tell me that they were concerned about getting the COVID vaccine because of the syphilis study? They didn't even know my grandfather was a part of the study. Tuskegee is a very sacred place. There is no way you cannot feel history. Think about the Tuskegee Airmen and all of the greatness that they did then to find out that in this same space, such an atrocious study was being heaped upon our men. The study began in 1932. Segregation and Jim Crow were the structures of how our society functioned. What happened with the men and their families? It was the untreating of syphilis. The original title of the study is the Tuskegee Study of 
untreated syphilis in the Negro male. They were not treated for the disease that killed them, that made them blind. My great great grandfather, John Hood, he was uh, the clergy, he was a farmer. He was a syphilitic in the study, and our family really didn't talk about it. Both of my great grandfathers have been a part of that study. They were sharecroppers. And then later they were able to get land of their own. On my right here is Ellie, where I was calling Big Daddy. My left here is Papa Frank Cooper, and he went blind at a young age. I am the daughter of one of the men, Freddie Lee Tyson. I'm also the daughter of Johnny May Neal Tyson. I have to include my wonderful mother because the two of them was on the journey together. My uncle used to always run after us. We'll get your ear, I'm gonna get, and we just run and run and run, and then we run right back to him. My grandfather and I were phenomenally close. He worked as a firefighter where the Tuskegee Airmen trained, actually caught my first fish with my grandfather. My father had congenital syphilis from his mother. There were a number of opportunities for the men to receive treatment, and they were very intentionally barred. And everyone involved in that study wanted it to go untreated until their death. Their body would then be sent to the autopsy to see the effect. Around 1947, penicillin became widely accepted and widely used. The doctors of the study prevented the men in the study from getting penicillin. First thing those doctors should have done for these gentlemen was to make sure that each and every fall of 72, my brother Wallace read an article about the study. A couple of days later, my father received a phone call indicating that he was in the study. When he found out what the study was really all about, that he had been used and treated as a guinea pig, there was just a lot of uh, shame in comparing um, what's happening today with COVID, with what happened back in 32, I see more of a contrast than a similarity. A lot of misinformation is out there that is causing people to think twice or to hesitate. And one of them is the fact they think the men were injected with syphilis, and they were not. And they were not injected with the spire key that causes syphilis. They were not being treated. That is very different from what's happening with COVID-19. The vaccine is being made available to anyone who wants it. Too many people are using the study as a way of causing their own selves to deny access to vaccines that would save their lives. And when we talk about COVID-19, for example, we're not talking about the non-treating of Blacks. We're talking about the treating of all people. The ways in which COVID-19 ravaged Black communities show that we have underlying vulnerabilities on something like a pandemic day. That to me really connects uh, what's happening now with a very important historical legacy. As a result of what happened to these men, it changed the course of American clinical research. It created the Institutional Review Boards, which is a very important intervention that says that there must be people who can examine every study that is done on human beings in this country. Wherever there's there's research that's happening has to be informed consent documents that are signed, not just when you're participating in clinical trials, but also if you're going to get any type of a medical procedure, those things came because of that study. It boils down to truly understanding the concept of community, which is two words, common unity. The path from tragedy to triumph travels along the path of learning. I've taken both of my vaccines, and you're talking about something that happens in my family. We can't do this by ourselves. In order for us to be healthy together, we need to all be vaccinated. <laughs> Thank you, Zuri. Dr. Hunter, 
uh, I would like to ask you the first question. As, as, as you know, both, of, both you and I are pharmacists, and a question that comes up all the time that I would like you to address is a, a, a lot of folks who are not vaccinated talk about how the vaccines were rushed, they were, they were created with too much urgency, and they have not been extensively studied for a long enough time. How do you respond to that? I think the response is always uh, related to how patients uh, understand how medication is essentially approved in general by the FDA. I think that's the that's part of the hesitancy. Um, understanding that there were animal studies done on these vaccines prior to them being given to humans. That's that's somewhere where we gather a lot of information in reference to medications that are approved by the FDA or even approved at an accelerated uh, process, like you see with the with the uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Um, following the animal studies that are preclinical studies, there are still phase one, phase two, and phase three trials that are conducted with the vaccines. Um, those, all of those trials gather safety information. They also verify efficacy or how well the vaccine uh, performs. And even following that, and that's probably where we're going to talk a lot today, is about the post-marketing or the po after the drug is actually being given to humans. Um, there's additional safety data that continues to be um, collected. And all of that data helps us take make conclusions on if it's safe for women who are pregnant, if it's safe for women who are breastfeeding, what age is safe in, uh, what, what patients um, should avoid it because they have these type of comorbidities. So information is continuously being um, obtained on the vaccine. And I think when I'm speaking to patients in the community or in the clinic, because I'm recommending the vaccine in all aspects that I practice as a pharmacist and a healthcare professional, uh, it's always about the fact that there are, you know, 600,000 plus patients who have died of COVID-19 um, in the United States. So that's not a, a debatable uh, fact. That's that, that's a fact. And that's where you have to do the benefit. Um, definitely outweighing the risk of, of death or severe illness um, if you don't get vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Uh, let me also welcome Dr. Hotez. Dr. Hotez, it's great to see you. We've, I've already it introduced you, and if my co-host doesn't mind, I would like to continue with a similar thought and ask the next question to Dr. Hotez. Yeah, apologies Hotez. for being a little. Apologies for being a little late. Uh, as usual, more emergence. Oh, it's, it's it's perfectly fine, Dr. Hotez. Thank you again for joining us, the TSU community, this evening. Uh, in in the same sort of thought process, Dr. Hotez, I want to ask you and. And I've, I've seen you maybe a thousand times on CNN talking about the only way out of this pandemic is for folks to get vaccinated and get us get us to that uh, that herd immunity. So what are you what are you hearing out there about the, the folks who still uh, are not willing? Uh, what are the main reasons for folks who are not willing to get vaccinated, knowing that important piece of uh, science? What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, we've gotten now 170,000 Americans vaccinated, and that's an accomplishment. But the reality is we have 80,000, 80 million Americans who we've not vaccinated who are eligible to be vaccinated. And this is why we're having this terrible Delta wave across the United States, particularly in our part of the country, because the vaccination rates among young people is so abysmal. So when you compare vaccinations among those over the age of 65, we don't look too bad here in Texas or in the South compared to the North. It's about 80% vaccinated versus 95, 99%. So there's a, a difference, but it's modest. The, where the bottom falls out is among young people. So, you know, in many, you, you look especially at some of the counties east of us, we're looking at maybe 25% of uh, adolescents vaccinated, 25% of young adults. And this is why this virus is ripping through those populations. So we're hearing uh, a lot of young people have misinformation. They think um, if they're healthy and fit and go to the gym that they don't need to get vaccinated because they're not going to die. And one, it's not true. Second, there are many things that happen in a hospitalization in terms of long COVID and gray matter brain degeneration that they're not being told. And um, this is why we've got our hospitals have filled up. We have now over 100,000 Americans are in the hospital tonight 
from COVID-19, one of the worst we've ever seen. And it's a younger age group, for instance, in our Texas Medical Center, it's people in their 30s and 40s. So, so the reason is one, the, the misunderstanding that, or, or being victimized by the disinformation campaign that people think they don't need to get vaccinated if they're young, it's not the case. And, and you know, I actually think that the specific reasons that are mentioned are less valid than what's really going on. So you've heard, well, I'm gonna wait till these are fully approved. I don't wanna be experimented on. Therefore, I don't trust the emergency use authorization process. And there's about a dozen or so uh, talking points, all of which are really fake, most of which are fake talking points. It's, the, the truth is this, um, uh, a good proportion are coming from conservative groups who are tuning into the conservative news channels at night and um, you're essentially being told that for your allegiance to the conservative movement, you shouldn't get vaccinated um, um, or that it's it's a conspiracy or that, um, and you heard it at the CPAC conference a few weeks ago um, that, that um, there, this is nothing more, vaccines are an instrument of political control to take our guns away, to take our Bibles away, as, as crazy as it sounds, right? There's enough Americans who, who believe that nonsense. And so I think that's done a lot of damage. So I think a lot of it are coming from conservative groups um, that are being deluged with misinformation from the conservative news channels, even members of Congress. Um, you know, we just heard from Congressman Jordan uh, yesterday, um, uh, who uh, from from Ohio? Who who said that uh, vaccine mandates are are un-American? I mean, where does that come from? I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, we've been mandating vaccines in schools and elsewhere for more than 200 years. Um, and then the other the other component that's been problem that's been really problematic is some of the disinformation has been targeting BIPOC communities, you know, Black and Brown communities. And there's this horrible, horrible, they call it a documentary. It's, it's not a documentary. It's a really disgusting film that shows um, people of color getting their Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And then it switches over to grainy images of uh, Tuskegee experimentation from the 50s and 60s and tries to draw a parallel between the two. And it's, it's really vile. And, um, but it's very effective in a, in a Pyrrhic way. So we're seeing, so, you know, we've actually done better, I think, reducing vaccine refusal and hesitancy in, among black and brown communities, um, mostly because all of us have really worked hard uh, on this, but that's still a piece as well. So overwhelmingly, it's more conservative groups that are the ones who are vaccine resistant hesitancy. We still have that important piece of vaccine hesitancy in BIPOC communities, but getting better. Um, I was on a, I was on a um, Zoom not too long ago. Um, um, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Freeman from Richmond, Virginia, has a church group and he invited me to go on his Zoom. And um, his pastor was on, this is a, one of the historic black churches in, in Richmond, Virginia. And we were talking and I said, you know, what, what do you think? And he goes, I, I you know, the numbers say that vaccine resistance and hesitancy is getting better in the African-American community. And, and the pastor said, you're right, I'm seeing that as well. I said, well, what, what do you attribute that to? And he said, well, part of it looks like you speaking out and that's been helpful. But then he said something really interesting. He said, you know, when the pastors of the black churches saw what was going on, they banded together in kind of an informal network. and and really chipped away at the problem. And I think, you know, they saved, I think the clergy, the clergy in the black churches saved a lot of lives, you know, because they said, we're not gonna let this happen. And uh, and so, you know, there, there are not a lot of silver linings in this pandemic, but that, that may be one of them, how the, 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 the clergy, the clergy, the pastors and, and African-American churches did step up in a big way. And that's an untold story. We need to tell that story better but I think they saved a lot of lives. Thank you, Dr. Honus. Uh, we stay open, back, back to you. Um, my next question is for Dr. Concho. So um, Dr. Concho, your lab was established to create knowledge about advancing and understanding autism through research. And I know 
particularly in some communities, that's a big thing, right? We know that that started somewhere. My question for you is through your research, have you found that parents who report skill loss, well, you have found in your research, I will say, that parents who report skill loss in their children are more likely to endorse vaccines as a cause for autism spectrum disorder. Where did that idea originate and how do you think it contributes to vaccine hesitancy or refusal? Yeah, so I think that's a, a really great question. So um, basically this came about from a study that was published back in 1998 on 12 kids who were being evaluated for gastrointestinal disturbances. And <clears throat> eight of the kids reportedly developed kind of a, a behavioral worsening, what they likened to a regressive onset of autism, um, following administration of the MMR vaccine. And what these investigators um, decided was that it was the, um, the chemicals, the ingredients in the vaccine that got into um, the, the gut and then got into the bloodstream and traveled to the brain. And that's what caused these children's autism. But <clears throat> it ended up coming out years later that this study was extremely flawed. Um, it, they looked back at some of the medical data and it was inconsistent with what had been reported. Some of the children already had a sort of symptoms or indications of autism before they had received their vaccine, but this wasn't reported. So anyway, just, um, you know, it kind of snowballed from there. But, um, you know, and, and fortunately, you know, the, the paper was retracted. Um, Andrew Wakefield, who was the lead author of the paper, um, he, he lost his medical license. Um, and so there have really been a lot of, you know, um, there's been a lot of fallout after that. However, you know, after this publication, you know, people immediately started saying, I'm not going to get my kids vaccinated. Um, and this initially happened in the UK. And, you know, after a few years, there were a couple of kids that actually died of measles there. Um, and so even though we've we've done a lot of work in terms of epidemiological studies around the globe after that to see if there was an association um, and there's not one. But <clears throat> it's kind of like the damage has been done. You know, um, there are lots of parents who really latch on to that theory about vaccines causing autism. It's spread to other vaccines aside from just the MMR. Um, and it, there are reports now that kids who um, have autism and their younger siblings are significantly more likely to be under vaccinated or unvaccinated compared to um, their unaffected counterparts. So. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think this is just, like I said, you know, a, a theory that parents have latched onto. And when when we can't give them a, a clear, firm, solid explanation for their child's autism, then, you know, they're going to they're going to latch on to what makes sense to them. And for a lot of parents, you know, this does. And unfortunately, this is misinformation that is shared through um, commonly through parent groups. You know, parents really, um, parents who have kids on the spectrum really rely on each other for support and look to each other for information about, hey, what should I do? What should I try? What have you done? Um, and so if you kind of learn about this idea through those groups, that can be really reinforcing. So let me ask you, Dr. Culture, what role do you think social media has played in the pandemic and how do you think social media influences vaccine uptake? Yeah, so um, I think that it, it seems pretty intuitive that, you know, you're going to be, if you're hearing about information through your social networks, um, that you're probably going to be influenced by them. You may be more likely to do something or less likely to do something because of that. Um, I think it, it, it's a little bit more complicated with COVID because, um, like Dr. Hotez was saying, you know, we're, we're getting lots of information from lots of different channels and, you know, how how much we put weight into one piece of information or, or one channel versus another, um, I think that makes a difference. Um, <clears throat> there, I was just looking at some literature earlier today suggesting that you know maybe actually um, the negative influences of social media specifically related to COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy might not be as um, influential as you might think. Um, however, I do think that there there is an opportunity to maybe leverage social media in a better way. So, um, again, like Dr. Hotez was saying, when we get our community influencers, you know, people who we know <clears throat> and trust in our neighborhoods, 
um, <clears throat> to talk to us about things and share information, I think that that could be a good way to use social media and our social networks to um, make, you know, pro-vaccine related decisions and share, you know, good information. Thank you. Dean. Uh, Dr. Boyer, let me let me ask you this question from the audience. As as we all know, you are a very a deeply engaged in community research. So this question comes from the audience tonight. I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, I feel like the public is not aware of how virulent the strain is. Do you think that there is a disconnect in the message to the targeted audience, especially young adults, about the new variant? and more sort of contagious version and variants to come. Do we have a messaging issue? Dr. Woodard, I believe you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes ma'am. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, I can't hear you anymore. There are some Wi-Fi okay. issues. Right. You could hear me, so I'm going to respond to the um, question that you posed. And so the question was about the Delta variant and um, basically messaging around the Delta variant to our communities. And I think that's a really important point that you because what we've heard and what is correct is that if we are vaccinated, we are at a much lower risk. We've also heard a message of vaccinate or mask. And these messages are very important and they are good messages for our community. But the concern that we have is that the Delta variant is highly transmissible. So even though we are vaccinated, it doesn't mean that we should stop doing the mitigation strategies that helped us when we first started to see a surge in COVID-19. So even though we're vaccinated, we have seen that there can be breakthrough cases of the COVID-19 Delta variant. We have also seen that if we're unvaccinated, there's a significant uh, risk of transmissibility of people becoming sick and hospitalized, um, of people who are much younger being hospitalized and ending up in the ice. So, it's a perpetual cycle of misinformation. And so I think the important thing to remember is that vac vaccination is important, but it is not sufficient. Our messaging has to be that we need to get vaccinated, but we also need to continue to do the things that helped us to lessen the surges previously. Washing our hands, social distancing. And so I think that that is where there's been a little in the messaging is that we felt like, well, if we get vaccinated, then we don't have things anymore. And we absolutely have to do these things together in order to continue to stem the tide of COVID-19 and to reduce the spread of uh, the Delta variant. And importantly, we have to target those groups that, you know, initially weren't our target groups as much, right? We said younger people did better. But as Dr. Hotez has mentioned now, with the Delta variant, we are seeing large numbers of younger people who are uh, unvaccinated and who are then um, experiencing more significant spread of the Delta variant and obviously uh, worse outcomes with increased hospitalizations, ICU stays, and even deaths. Thank you. Ms. Dale. Um, Dr. Woodard, I have another um, question for you. So I know that you do a lot of work with contact tracing and surveillance. Um, my question for you is through tracing, what have you found to be the most common ways in which individuals are exposing others or getting exposed to COVID? I know that there are some disconnects there, but what are some commonalities that you have identified in the tracing that you have done through your program? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the important thing about contact tracing is that contact tracing um, helps us to identify individuals who have been in contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. And so when we think about the way COVID-19 spread, either through someone breathing um, in close proximity to us or coughing or sneezing, um, or again, sort of touching our hands, uh, our mouth, our eyes, um, when we're infected with the COVID-19 uh, virus, 
that helps you to see exactly how COVID-19 is being transmitted and who is at risk, right? So it's people who are in close proximity to others um, because of the nature, for example, of their work, right? So we had essential workers who were forced to work and didn't have the luxury of um, working from home, right? So they had increased exposure. So we saw individuals who worked in places where they weren't um, able to social distance or able to, again, stay home from work being infected. We saw individuals um, because of their socioeconomic status who lived in multi-generational households, right, where it was very difficult to isolate um, being infected when we talked about transmission of COVID-19. We also saw individuals who, because of things like not having sick leave at work, not testing, and then not knowing that they were positive for COVID-19 and then being able to spread COVID-19. Then we saw asymptomatic spread as well, right? So there were individuals who were affected with, infected with COVID-19 who didn't know it, who were able to spread that um, regardless of sort of what setting uh, they may have found themselves in. So I think it's important to how COVID-19 is transmitted and to understand that anytime you're in places where you're in close proximity and you're not able to social distance, whether, um, you know, it's our, sometimes our settings now where individuals don't have, ma are not masking and are not able to distance, whether it's large gatherings, um, you know, indoor events, right? Those are places where we see transmission. And that's been true of the COVID-19 pandemic from its inception and is even, I think, more true now as we see the Delta variant, which we know is two times um, as transmissible as the, you know, native variants that we saw when we started with COVID-19. Dr. Woodard, I have one more question. You made a very interesting point. We know that some groups are going to be, um, facially um, in, in places where they may be more impacted by COVID-19 just due to their place of work, um, them residing in congregate settings, um, just them being in an environment, high transmissibility environment. So my question for you is, as a community engaged researcher and a black person in America and a clinician, knowing what you know and knowing what we know to be fact, when you are faced with the issue of COVID-19 and vaccination, how are you working with your patients to engage them in vaccine uptake despite a history of, and in some cases, ongoing medical distress? Yeah, I think that's an important question. And I think, you know, it's difficult to just tell people to trust a system that hopefully has not served them well. And so uh, what I have tried to do with my patients and what I think we all have to do is to approach this from a place of listening, right? Oftentimes we want to tell our patients what it is that they need to do. And we've heard feedback as we've done research around this from communities, particularly communities of color that have been uh, labeled as vaccine hesitant. They say, well, we're not hesitant. We just want information. We want transparent information. And so in many ways, shifting that language saying these are individuals who um, are empowered to learn more about their health and to learn more about vaccination has been something that's been helpful. The other thing that I found is being curious, right? So rather than assuming we know why somebody doesn't want to be vaccinated, and I think we heard um, Dr. Hotez talk about this some, right? we need to be curious. We need to understand what are people's reasons for not wanting to be vaccinated so that we can uh, not say it's a one size fits all, but understand an individual's perspective and why they have concerns and try to address that individual's concerns. And then as we've heard from you know, our panelists, the importance of um, engaging our community, a lot of the work around getting individuals vaccinated has focused on grassroots community organizations. And I think it's very important for people to have individuals who they trust, whether it's their clergy, whether it's their medical professionals, uh, whether it's civic organizations like our fraternities and sororities, um, all of these individuals who are trusted in the community are important in helping to convey that message. And so traditionally, a lot of times we've had sort of the academics who are saying this is what needs to be done. But in this setting, we have found that it is the trusted voices of the community that are uh, really the most powerful. And sometimes that's that, you know, I got vaccinated and I'm able to tell members of my family, hey, I got vaccinated and I did okay to get vaccinated as well. So again, understanding who those trusted voices are and engaging them 
has been important. And in talking to patients, it's really been about understanding where the hesitancy is. Because a lot of times if you have a conversation, you can shift people um, to a willingness to be vaccinated. Thank you. Dean? Dr. Hotez, we, we received a number of questions. Uh, and I'm going to ask you two that are related, uh, that are just purely scientific questions regarding the vaccine. So the first one is, does the vaccine alter your DNA? And, and also, would it cause infertility? Or are there studies done regarding infertility? So. Well, like many of my generation, I read um, Strunk and White's Elements of Style, and part of that says omit needless words. So the answer is no to both. Um, but I could, I could elaborate. Um, so um, regarding modifying your DNA, there uh, is no evidence for that. Um, uh, it's important to remember that mRNA um, does get taken up by your cells, but in the cytoplasm, not the nucleus. And, and as anyone who's taken a high school biology course would know that the DNA is in the nucleus and the RNA is in the cytoplasm, and you're not going to have your genes modified. Um, with regards to, um, what was the second question again? The second question was, would it would it cause infertility? No, uh, yeah, no, it does not. And and that that's a fake assertion. Where the anti-vaccine groups, what they did was they copy pasted that fake assertion from the HPV vaccine for cervical cancer and other cancers. Anti-vaccine groups claim the same thing for the HPV vaccine, and that was also not true, and they just copy pasted. So, um, no, it does not. In fact, we know that a lot of pregnant women who are unvaccinated have lost their lives from COVID in the last year and a half. And so pregnant women do not do well with this virus. Very high rates of ICU admissions, hospitalizations, even deaths, and we've seen tragic story after tragic story of pregnant women who have lost their lives from COVID. As and now we know that pregnant women who are vaccinated do quite well; they have good responses to the vaccine, and the vaccines are saving their lives. and um, And they have a great safety record in, in pregnancy. So if you're pregnant or you're about to become pregnant, get vaccinated. Number one. Number two. Um, there's even the added benefit in that the antibodies you get from your vaccine can be passed on to your newborn baby through breastfeeding or through vertical transmission and protect your newborn baby as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hunter, let me uh, ask you a question uh, regarding how have we come together as pharmacists? How have we pulled our assets together to, to help in this, uh, this fight to help more people get vaccinated. Can you talk to us a little bit from the the uh, the pharmacist perspective? Yeah, I think you know pharmacists are so important in in this, and I you know and I've been talking to pharmacists now for for a few years because you know pharmacists because the American people interact a lot with their pharmacists that they're. I, I don't have the numbers to back it up, but I'm willing to guess that the American people probably interact more with pharmacists than any other healthcare providers on a regular basis. And they're trusted, they're knowledgeable, and they are a tremendous source of, of good vaccine information. And and so no question that our pharmacists are our 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 greatest ally in this fight to Get everybody uh, vaccinated, and I can't I can't thank them enough. And and I also think this is why we uh, you know really need to ensure that we do a lot of vaccination and vaccine training in schools of pharmacy because they've been on the front line so so much in this. And so working with farm the Society of Pharmacists, working with PharmDs, talking to them on a on a regular basis is so absolutely critical. So no question. Pharma, the pharmacists, our PharmDs, our pharmacy school graduates have been heroes uh, in uh, throughout this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Dr. Hotez. As you well know, here in the College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, we actually opened a vaccination clinic 
with help from St. Luke's Hospital. Mm -hmm. It started in February and the vaccination clinic still continues. Dr. Hunter, can you follow up on that comment, the comments from uh, Dr. Hothes, uh as a as a pharmacist at Memorial Hermann? Tell us a little bit more. Sure, sure. I think it's a, it's a thing that was not necessarily present when I graduated from pharmacy school in 2007 was our front lines approach to actually administering the vaccines. That when I was in pharmacy school, we did not actually receive training to administer vaccines. That was done after I got finished with pharmacy school. So now it's an expectation. It's something that I think the public expects to get the majority of their flu vaccines, as well as a great deal of COVID vaccines have been administered by pharmacists across the country and in the community setting, as well as, you know, in um, you know offices, uh, we, we are administering vaccines at Reliance. I mean, pharmacists are administering vaccines um, all throughout the country. And I think that that has been a big help in reference to the volume of patients that are being vaccinated. The hundreds of millions of patients that have been vaccinated over the past year and a half could not have been done without the uh, help of pharmacists. Uh, when you look at what was happening in the doctor's office and what was happening in hospitals, that's accounting for a percentage of the amount of patients that are being vaccinated. But there are millions of patients, you know, probably 80, tens of millions of patients that have been vaccinated actually at your community pharmacy or in the uh, community setting where we're talking about large you know, stadiums, things of that sort. So my pharmacy students, as well as I myself, have probably administered, you know, 2,000 vaccines myself uh, since the pandemic has begun. So it's been great to, you know, get out there and help um, in the public eye um, and also help to overcome this pandemic with our other healthcare professionals. Thank you, sir. Ms. Dale, back to you. Okay, I have some questions. I really want to get down to the basics here. We have a ton of questions that I feel like either of us are equipped to answer. So I'm going to throw a couple of out there and anyone who wants to answer these questions, feel free. One of the questions that I have, and this is really getting down to the basics, can you get COVID from the administration of the vaccine? That's part one. And then the second part of this question is, well, um, how long do you have to wait after a COVID exposure to get the vaccine? So two part question. Number one, can you get COVID from the vaccine? Part two is, all right, I got COVID. So how long do I have to wait to get vaccinated? Anybody can jump in and answer that for us. Well, in terms of how long to wait, um, if you've gotten COVID, the Centers for Disease Control says you may not you're unlikely to get reinfected for 90 days afterwards. But of course, that's pre-Delta information. I don't think we necessarily know that anymore. And, and, and it doesn't say you can't get vaccinated before 90 days. They're saying you may not need to get vaccinated. But I, I, wouldn't, I would not wait 90 days. So, you, know, you can wait a, you know, a few weeks and I think you know, you know, three, four weeks and then, and then go ahead and get vaccinated, I think. Uh, uh, you know, and then we know people who are infected and recovered do quite well after uh, getting uh, getting vaccinated. They have broadly neutralizing antibodies and are quite um, resilient against a lot of the new variants. So even though you're infected, you still want to get vaccinated. All right. So can you get, can you get, go ahead, Dr. Hunter. That's one of the, I was going to address the second question in reference to getting, you know, testing positive for COVID if you've actually received the vaccine, which is not necessarily correct. I think the big thing that patients um, should understand is that there are uh, immunoglobulins. There's di there's different, you know, chemicals that are showing up um, when patients are getting antibody tests that may actually test positive, and that's just your body reacting um, to the vaccine. And that's not necessarily mean that you're positive for COVID. You're making those antibodies and you're building that immune response that we hope that you do build uh, to protect, protect yourself from COVID. The second part of that is that, of course, like in an exception of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, when you're talking about Pfizer or you're talking um, about the Moderna vaccine, they are a two-shot series. So there have been you know, multiple patients who have actually received maybe the first shot and actually already had COVID at that point. Because I've, I'm, I'm telling you this because I've had patients that have said, you know, I got COVID from the shot. The first shot, I got COVID. Well, there's a good chance the infection was actually already present prior to the shot being given. And so the patient is under the assumption that they actually got COVID from the shot. If you get 
the vaccine, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're now gonna not gonna test negative for COVID. If you already have COVID when you get the vaccine, then you're you're in a you're kind of in a uncharted territory in reference to what we do medically, but from a perspective of how you're going to test, if you test to see if you have it, you're going to test positive. You have COVID. So the, those patients, that's something to definitely understand. You will not test positive for COVID on a PCR test from the vaccine. You could test positive if you had COVID prior to receiving the vaccine, which unfortunately patients uh, do very frequently um, in the community. I can tell you that from you know professional experience. We have a question in the chat. Um, and I'm going to throw this out there, Dr. Woodard, um, you might want to answer this question. How do you explain the apparently large number of healthcare workers, particularly nurses, that refuse the vaccine? My sister-in-law is a nurse and is the only family member who is not vaccinated. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I I've, honestly, I can't explain it. I do not understand why uh, healthcare professionals uh, with the science that exists would make a choice to not be vaccinated. Um, you know, I will say healthcare professionals are, you know, individuals like, you know, everyone else who say that they have a religious reason not to be, you know, not to be vaccinated or um, that they have concerns about the vaccine, but I honestly cannot explain why a healthcare worker, knowing the science, would choose not to be vaccinated, not only to protect themselves, but to protect their family to go home to after taking care of patients with COVID, and then to protect their patients that they, that they see. So um, I, I don't have a good answer for you, except to say that, you know, as a healthcare professional, I believe science. And so um, I hope that most of our professionals um, do as well and choose to be vaccinated. We have another question from the chat. This is regarding the booster shot. Is the booster shot going to be effective? And what happens with people who have already had the third shot or the booster before FDA approval? Is there any negative ramification of having got the third shot before FDA approval? I believe that's what that might be asking. And who's that for? This is Michelle Taylor who's asked this question in the chat. No, but for who? Is, um, um, it just says, is the booster going to be effective? What happens with for, people who have already had the third shot before for, FDA approval? For anyone, oh. Dr. Hotez, anyone. I think it's for anyone, Dr. Hotez. Oh, well. anyone, Dr. Hotez. Hotez. I mean, so the, the good news is the FDA VRPAC committee is going to uh, offer an opinion on this on September 17th. So we'll get more information. I think, you know, the, the, the risk is, you know, part of the problem is that the data is not widely available in terms of both the safety and efficacy. And, and unfortunately, we're just getting bits and pieces of the data from the Israel Ministry of Health website, um, some preprints like from the Mayo Clinic, and, and, and the VRPAC committee will openly review that safety data on September 17th. So the, the risk is that there's a safety problem with the third immunization, um, such as maybe a heightened risk of myocarditis or something along those lines. I doubt it. Uh, I think we would have heard about it by now and I, and I have not seen any evidence for it, but we don't know for sure. And so that's the problem. We're operating uh, on, on inadequate safety data um, uh, without without having all of the package fully outlined and most of the data is not publicly available or it's available in unreliable places. I mean, you don't want to be getting your important information from uh, another government's Ministry of Health website or or a Pfizer CEO shareholders meeting and who puts up a PowerPoint slide or a company press release. And that, that's the reason why it's prudent uh, to wait unless you think you're immunocompromised and that's a different story. The um, FDA has weighed, weighed in and CDC have weighed in on this in a big way and said, if you are if you uh, meet any of the criteria for being immunocompromised, then you should certainly go ahead now and get that third immunization. 
Um, just to just to add to that in reference to the booster, a uh, common um, question that patients also have is about the mismatch of one booster, like one brand of the vaccine versus another, and all of the data is coming out initially will come out where you need to consistently go through and if you have initially received Pfizer, you kind of continue on with Pfizer, and if you receive Moderna, you can continue on with Moderna. And the Johnson & Johnson is by far like the one that the, the, the questions are asked the most and the information is people really want that information is the fact that when you're talking about Johnson & Johnson, the first data will possibly be available will be with a Johnson & Johnson booster, not switching over to like Moderna or Pfizer. So, the you know, the data is, is going to it's going to take longer. They're already starting those studies where they're mismatching the vaccines where you give like Moderna initially and then you switch over to Pfizer for the booster. But that data is going to be lagging compared to the, the information obtained when Pfizer is following Pfizer and Moderna is following Moderna. You know, I've always been saying since the beginning that, you know, based on the dosing schedule, when those first two doses of Pfizer or Moderna were given three to four weeks apart, we needed to do that to fully vaccinate the American people in a hurry because so many people were losing their lives, especially nursing home residents and healthcare providers. Uh, and I'm glad we did that. It saved a lot of lives. The problem is for creating long lasting, durable protection, that's not the vaccine schedule you would pick. You'd be, I mean, if you look at most of our pediatric vaccines, for instance, we give it several vaccines in rapid fire um, in order to create a primary immunization, but then we wait six months to a year and then boost. And that's what gives you that long lasting durable protection. And really the mRNA vaccines are going by that same playbook. Though I've been saying that, you know, for a while that this, this was always a three dose vaccine. I think it could have been messaged a little bit better from the beginning, it really wasn't. Um, and so now we're, so that the, that the waning of, a, of the immunity that we're seeing is actually predicted. And so it shouldn't alarm people. It's not like something terrible is happening. This is be expected. And now we'll move forward with that third immunization. And I think we'll probably need a second immunization for the J&J &J vaccine. We have, and one of the things that's not that's not as good is the fact that and one of the reasons we have so much information about the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine is because we're getting that data out of the out of Israel in the UK and so they're they're doing a much better job monitoring vaccine effectiveness I think than the US government is and so that's been a problem uh, with with the Centers for Disease Control and that's why we have even less data on the Moderna or the J&J &J vaccine is because those vaccines are not being used any appreciable extent in Israel or the UK. But the data will be forthcoming, I think. And, and so Pfizer is uh, applying now. Uh, the data will be reviewed publicly by the FDA VRPAC committee. Now you want me to say what that stands for, probably vaccine and related biologics, um, uh, 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 that, that advisory committee. Uh, product advisory committee. So that's kind of, that will be on the 17th. Then, then we'll get the information from Moderna to follow. And I think J&J &J after that. Um, so um, that's going to be a busy fall for vaccinations. And then I think we'll also start hearing about um, emergency use for kids under the age of 12. I think that's going to be probably what's coming next. Thank you. Is, if I If I could ask you a question. You're a prominent virologist, so let's let's uh, imagine that we're having this conversation in 2025. What is COVID vaccination is going to look? Like? Is it tip, is it similar to a what we've done in the country with flu? How how do you how do you predict the future as as we move along this vaccine? And well, one of the things we've learned in this pandemic is don't predict anything more than two or three weeks in advance. But since you asked, um, the, um, you know, I, I actually think with that third immunization, which is going to give more long lasting and durable protection, that could be it for a while. I mean, there are some people who feel we may need annual boosters. I'm in, it's, and that's possible. I'm in the camp that says, I don't think we're going to need that. I think this could be it for a while. Um, but there's by no means consensus in the scientific community. In fact, the Pfizer CEO has said they're looking at creating a combined COVID-19 flu vaccine so they could do this every year. I, but I don't, I don't see that in the cards, at least, at least for now, unless something 
unless something changes. Thank you. Having said that, um, this will not be our last coronavirus pandemic. Um, we had SARS in 2002, 2003. We had MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome in 2012. That's the reason we started making coronavirus vaccines because um, we were, that was not our major focus. Our major focus has been parasitic disease vaccines. We got into coronavirus vaccines because they were orphaned and nobody cared about them at that point. So we started doing this and, and we did it because we knew a third one was coming and sure enough, COVID-19 hit. And, I would, and now our lab is even looking at the potential for making a, a universal coronavirus vaccine that's possible to create a vaccine that would be broadly neutralizing against all the major beta coronaviruses. And, and that may be very useful. And, and the scientific community is looking at that in a big way. Thank you, Dr. Hodes. Ms. Dale. There is one question. There's one more question in the chat that I want to go ahead and pose before we wrap up today. Ms. Washington wants to know, how does the getting vaccinated help protect other people? We've thrown around this concept of herd immunity a lot. We've talked about this a lot. I want to end our conversation with a really good explanation about how each of us getting vaccinated protects others around us. And that question is for anyone who would like to answer. Dr. Hotez, would you like, Dr. Woodard, Dr. Hotez, would you like to end us with this question? Yeah, I mean, I've stopped using the term herd immunity because it's been so abused by those with political agendas. And you heard Senator Rand Paul, for instance, say herd immunity is going to be a 22% ridiculous numbers like this. I don't even use it anymore. What I say is eventually if enough Americans get vaccinated and are immune, then we'll re reduce transmission, maybe even halt transmission, so people know what you're actually talking about. Um, and um, and I think that's where we uh, that's where we need to head towards is to fully vaccinate the American people. But the bar is high because this is such a highly transmissible virus agent. It's going to mean you know 85% of the U.S. population now has got to get vaccinated, and not 85% of the adults of the population. And since we take 15% off the top because of the kids under the age of 12 not eligible to be vaccinated, it pretty much means all the adults and all of the adolescents. And you might say, well, gee, that's not possible. Well, it is. We do it every year for measles, right? And then we reach that kind of level. And that's what we have to do to prevent measles epidemics. So we can do it, but the bar is very high. And, and it may mean not only doing it 85%, but 85% fully immunized, which may mean three doses or two doses, depending on which vaccine you're, you're getting. So it's work, and we're not even close to that, especially in the South, where vaccine hesitancy is at its worst. So we've, so this is why, you know, when, when you invited me to come on and, and talk to this group at Texas Southern University, I jumped at the opportunity because it's so important uh, to do this. So Dean Mosavin, thank you for, for having me and always, uh, you know, in happier times, I would come to Texas Southern, and uh, it's not too far from where I live, and uh, and and do this in person. But some, that'll be an aspirational goal to look forward to. Absolutely, thank thank you so much, and, and Ms. Dale. So, Ms. Dale, if I could just add to what you said, I think it's important for people to understand that as we get vaccinated and we stop the spread of COVID nineteen to reduce the variants that we see develop because we have people who are not vaccinated, right? And we're continuing to see mutations. So I think that's the other thing that's important for people to understand. You, you, by being vaccinated, we're going to reduce, but we're also going to reduce the variants that we're seeing as we've seen become more and more uh, transmissible. Dean, you may close us out. Thank you so much. Ms. Dale, thank you so much for being a great co-host uh, panel. Thank you so much, everyone, Dr. Hotez, Dr. Woodard, Dr. Keshul, and Dr. Hunter. Thank you so much for your time this evening. And to all of our participants, we, we certainly hope that you found this informative and helpful. All of you, be well. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.